Actira is a huge group that covers uh, all kinds of different species. We'll just mention one genus here, Trichodesmium, which is a type of cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria have, in addition to chlorophyll, they have another pigment called phycocyanin, which is a bluish color of pigment. And what's important about cyanobacteria is they're capable of nitrogen fixing in the atmosphere there's a whole bunch of nitrogen, but the nitrogen gas that's in the atmosphere, we can't really use that. In order to build proteins, you had to have that amino group and it's used elsewhere as well. But So we need nitrogen for building those proteins. So in order to be able to have any kind of protein, you need some kind of organism that can fix that nitrogen into an organically usable kind of nitrogen. That process is called nitrogen fixation, and not a lot of things can do that. Cyanobacteria, this trichodesmium, is one of those. There are other species that are also capable of doing photosynthesis. There are ones that do denitrification, which is going the other way. Take inorganic nitrogen that's produced by fish urine, for example, in the form of like ammonia, and then being able to convert that or break that down back into atmospheric nitrogen. And then there is more bacteria that are important for the decay process and breaking things down. There are also these other types of cyanobacteria that uh, are worth mentioning here. And these structures are called stromatolites. And what's important about the stromatolites is some of the oldest Stromatolites, I believe, found in Australia, 3.5 billion years old. They are the oldest fossils of anything we've ever found. And so that's why we believe that life probably started 3.5 billion years ago, at least because in the fossil record, we actually have these stromatolites um, that suggest that. And last but not least, then we'll go into the eukarya, and we talk about the eukarya, it's going to be a little bit different here. Um, your book tries to break down the eukarya kind of the old school way. Let me tell you this, back in the day, you know, 1990s and before that, um, we had uh, different kingdoms. We had an animal kingdom, uh, and that worked out well. And we had a plant kingdom, and that worked out well. And we had a fungus kingdom, and that worked out well. We had a bacteria kingdom, and that worked out well. But there was a very large number of organisms that fit into this kind of otter category that we just called protozoa. And nobody knew quite what to do with that until they came up with the three domain system where they kind of put the eukarya out like you see it now. And so now instead of having one group called that, each one has its own little name. We're not gonna learn every single one of those. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna grab a couple as we go that are important. So for example, first on the list are the dinoflagellates. And the dinoflagellates um, are these really, really neat um, organisms that have a cell wall. Now we didn't talk about a cell wall yet, but if you look over here at this algae, remember we talked about the cell membrane and all cells have this cell membrane. Well, some cells outside of the cell membrane have this other structure called a cell wall and it, it sort of protects the cell. And in these dinoflagellates, they have a cell wall that's made out of cellulose. Cellulose is the carbohydrate in it's the polysaccharide that is found in the cell walls of plants. Uh, celery or a lot of salad, one of the reasons that people go on diets and eat a lot of stuff like that is we can't break down cellulose. Um, and so there's very little energy for us, at least in food with a lot of cellulose in it. And so dinoflagellates have that in common. Dinoflagellates also will go through these blooms where if they get too many nutrients, they will sort of reproduce and there'll be a bunch of them and they will produce what are called red tides. And these red tides make the water look sort of uh, muddy. And sometimes in those red tides, 
there are there are quite often there's there's toxins that are produced, particularly when the dinoflagellates die, and different organisms will consume those and and become uh, sick or will become basically filled with the poison. And you can eat certain fish or certain what we call shellfish, like if you're eating clams or that type of thing, or you eat the fish that ate those. If they're filled with those toxins, you can get what they call cicatera poisoning from eating those. And then there are some dinoflagellates that actually can produce light. They're bioluminescent. And one of the coolest one of those is in Puerto Rico. I think they call it the Bay of Fire. In this video here, you can see the bioluminescence of some of these dinoflagellates. Another group are what we call diatoms. Diatoms have a cell wall that's made out of silica dioxide. It's a silicon atom with two oxygens, and we call that silica dioxide, which is basically glass. So it's a glass material, and they're made up of these two tightly uh, fitting halves of these shells, and we call this shell, we call it a frustule. It has little tiny holes inside of it, and when the uh, when the diatom dies, it actually makes these shells and it deposits them on the ocean. They're placed in the ocean with a huge number of these layers and layers and layers of these dead diatoms, and that forms diatomaceous earth. And uh, diatomaceous earth is mined sometime from the ocean, uh, and it is used because of the little tiny holes inside these hard uh, glass-like structures. Uh, they are used quite often for things like filters. They use those uh, for, as filters in swimming pools. Uh, they use them to filter out certain uh, chemicals in beer production. And uh, I don't know if they still use them, but they used to be used inside toothpaste uh, as a mild abrasive to help scrape the bacteria and things uh, off your teeth. The next group we have are the foraminiferans, and these also have a shell on them. Uh, we call the shell, in this case, we call it a test. Uh, and the test, or the shell, of the foraminiferans is made up yet of another kind of material called calcium carbonate, and that's a calcium atom that is then bound to um, a carbonate group, which is a carbon atom with three oxygens and that's what calcium carbonate looks like and at the bottom of the ocean they form what they call a foraminiferin ooze um, and they are they are very highly specific so there's a whole bunch of different foraminiferins and they're very sensitive to temperature and light and things like that. And so because there are so many of them and because they're so sensitive, uh, what ends up happening is throughout the world, they are very useful for oil exploration and for also studying for climate change because we can, we can find where there's likely to be oil deposits based on the core samples they take where they find certain foraminiferins. And we can also determine what climate was like in different times um, because the foraminiferins are so highly specific to climate change. All right, our next group are the radiolarians. These have a cell wall made out of silica dioxide, very much like diatoms. Many of these are really neat to look at under a microscope because they have these incredibly neat three-dimensional structures. It looks like artwork in many different ways. Okay, now we're going to get into our different kinds of algae. So you might think of algae as being, well, algae is just some slimy green stuff, but there's actually different types of algae. We'll start with the green algae because the green algae contains chlorophyll and generally no other pigments. So the green is most noticeable and green algae is the most closely related of the algae to different kinds of plants. Then we have brown algae, and brown algae contain fucoxanthin, which is a hard word to say, fucoxanthin, 
You almost say a bad word when you try to say fucoxanthin. Uh, and fucoxanthin is a sort of brownish color pigment. And they have that in addition to chlorophyll. Um, so one type of brown algae, of which there are many, is kelp. So kelp is a type of brown algae. We mentioned that before. It's used for making uh, cosmetics and they use it for making ice cream and all kinds of other stuff. So uh, the kelp forests are basically a large collection of all kinds of brown algae. Then we have red algae next and red algae. Red algae contains phycourethrin and phycourethrin is a sort of reddish color pigment. They have that in addition to chlorophyll. They're once again a producer. And if you ever eat sushi, the nori, the nori is the wrap that they wrap around sushi, which is when they dry it out is very, very green. But the, the red algae it comes from when it's alive, when it's, you know, not dried out, um, has a more reddish color to it. So nori is that they use in the sushi wraps is a kind of red algae. And then actually we do have plants in the ocean, uh, not obviously nearly as many as on land, but two of the common plants that we have right here, right off our coast that you can see, which are types of flowering plants. One of them being surf grass, which is right in the tide pools. And you can see that if you go down to the beach where there's tide pools growing right in uh, amongst the rocks and whatnot, out kind of, you know, in the water, obviously, but you'll see what is called surf grass. And then if you were a, if you were snorkeling or if you were diving uh, in some of our local areas in fairly shallow water, we also have eel grass in our local ecosystems and also a local flowering plant uh, that is found in the ocean. And so once again, all those different organisms that we just talked about fit in the bottom part of the pyramid. This is where your producers are. And so we kind of lumped in things that are small, the plankton, um, in addition to, because many of them are in fact producers, but we also then put in the other marine producers, which are things like the different kinds of algae, which can be very big and are not necessarily plankton. Um, and we also threw in um, our flowering plants. All right. So there you go, everybody. Have a good night.